The Nanyang Technological University in Singapore and Rolls-Royce have launched a $75 million laboratory to ramp up research efforts in Singapore. The Rolls-Royce at NTU Corporate Lab will work on 32 new projects over the next five years. The lab will focus on fundamental research and pioneering technology to develop innovative solutions in large-scale manufacturing and repair, such as reducing noise and emissions, which will benefit sustainability. The lab will train up to 70 researchers researchers and 165 graduate and undergraduate students. Half of them are expected to be locals. The lab is also the first to be supported under the National Research Foundation's Corporate Lab at University Scheme. So we have a network of such centers uh, around the world, but only two in Asia, and this is certainly the biggest in Asia, and, and the most uh, widespread in the, the fields it's looking at, uh, so uh, it's, it's very important to us. A key outcome of this partnership will be the development of our scientific and engineering talent. The launch marks the start of a journey for Rolls-Royce and NTU. It is at the same time a significant achievement for Singapore's aerospace and transport engineering sector. A female elephant gave birth just before the Buddhist Lent in Thailand's central province of Ayutthaya. A 20-year-old female elephant named Jintara gave birth at the Elephant Kral in Swan Prik sub-district of Pra Nakhon Si Ayutthaya district last week. The baby elephant is female and healthy. Its father, named Siam, is a good breed. The baby elephant is the 57th elephant that starves of the Elephant Kral had bred. Romsai Mifan, the owner of the elephant kraal, said the baby elephant was named Yokfa, jade from the sky, because it is beautiful. She said its mother, Jintara, is clever and already gave birth twice. She thinks the delivery is auspicious as it happens just before the Asalha Puja day and the Buddhist land. The lost city of Mahendra Parvata was found in the Cambodian town of Siem Reap with the help of new laser mapping techniques, archaeologists announced in mid-June last month. Mahendra Varpata, thought to predate the Angkor Wat, built in the 12th century by about 350 years, at present quietly sleeps under thick jungle and landmines buried during the Cambodian Civil War. LIDAR, the new laser mapping technology, made it possible for archaeologists to exactly profile the ground beneath the jungle and further realize the existence of a lost city. Um, it's just, uh, it's massive. It's a complete revolution. Um, I'd say it's the biggest archaeological find in a century, even more. Stephanie's colleagues and theories about a lost city around the Mount Kulin before had found little evidence because it was hard to do thorough surveys under such ground conditions. Now, Stephanie and his colleagues finally realized a city of the size of the current Cambodian capital, Phnom Penh, had surrounded them all this while. The existing sites of Mount Kulin and other temples around suggested the city was significant, implying the roots of the civilization that created Angkor, but were mostly hidden in the deep jungle. Cambodian archaeologists believe that the city may be related to the great King Jayavarman II, who liberated the nation from the Javanese and reunited the country's warring states. For Stefan and his colleagues, the map was just the tip of the iceberg, as they say they knew there was a city but still did not know anything about it. They added there is a bigger mystery of a king waiting for them to unlock. Mong Rathi Group, MRG, will begin construction on a $16 million crude palm oil refinery next month in Priyasihanuk province, where several thousand hectares of palm trees are grown. Mong Rathi, president of the eponymous firm, told the media that his company intends to start construction on the 60-ton capacity refinery in April, with a plant to be finished within 12 months. The company began planting palm oil trees in 1995 when its 5-ton capacity refinery was built, but as growing numbers of palm trees were planted in the area, the company decided to upgrade the refinery to reach 30-ton capacity per hour. MRG expects the production of crude palm oil to increase to 22,000 tons this 
year, out of 110,000 tons of palm crops, up from 18,000 tons of crude oil production in 2012. The bulk of his company's crude palm oil is exported to Malaysia, from where it is sent to Thailand, India and Europe. A charity activity has recently taken place in Indonesia during the holy month of Ramadan to help people in need by collecting money from smokers. Most people who do not smoke have little idea how much a pack of cigarettes sell for. But for Sekar Sosno Negoro, the founder of Sembako Ramadan, which converts money saved by volunteers who abstain from smoking during Ramadan into much-needed staples such as rice, sugar and oil for families across Indonesia. Ramadan is a time for restraints and a time for giving. Sekar seems to have found the perfect combination in the world's most populous Muslim country and also one of the world's highest rates of smokers. The movement encourages smokers to donate a portion of their cigarette money that's not being used because of the fasting month to help the needy by giving them basic food necessities. Sekar said one of the uniqueness of the program is because a donator or smoker do not have to allocate a certain budget to do charity. With the average smoker going through three packs a week at 150 US dollars per pack, the movement has raised 42 million rupees, that's 4,000 US dollars, in two Ramadan months. Money that was once slated for cigarettes has turned them into much needed groceries, like rice and sugar, among other essentials. Started as a Twitter idea, the movement has helped over 1,000 families, and the campaign has also given smokers something to think about. The beauty of the campaign is that it is using a soft approach. No one is made to feel guilty by their smoking habits, but rather they're given a chance to see how much difference they can make to other people's lives using the money that will otherwise be burnt. And with staggering statistics estimating that roughly 7 out of 10 Indonesians smoke, the program has a great potential in both providing much-needed help to the poor communities and create awareness among smokers. Segar said in the long term, the program tries to demonstrate that meaningless smoking habit can instantly be turned into meaningful charity tradition. Brunei Dar es Salaam's unique kinds of traditional handicraft work such as weaving, silversmithing, brass making, sculpturing, keris making, songkok making and plating have been in existence in the country for hundreds of years. Fortunately, the creative abilities of people in the yesteryears have been handed down through the generations and adapted by the younger generations of today through education and learning opportunities provided by the Brunei Arts and Handicraft Training Centre. One of the notable traditional works is the making of Brunei's own woven fabric, the Jong Sarat. The Brunei Arts and Handicraft Training Centre was established in 1975 and is situated at Jalan Residency, Bandar Sri Begawan, plays a major role in churning out individuals that are skilled in weaving the Jong Sarat. Such a unique skill is not only mastered by the elders, as youths can now be found engaging themselves in the art. The knowledge gained is not just limited to the making of Xinjiang, but also extends to a number of accessories based on the Jong Sarat, such as neckties, handbags and home decorations. The Jong Sarat is woven using high quality gold thread. This uniquely Bruneian fabric is rising in stature in the international area. The Jong Sarat was worn in various colours by ASEAN heads of state and government during the 22nd ASEAN summit in Bandar Sri Begawan in April. Meanwhile, it is hoped that the Jong Sarat will continue to receive a favourable response from the local community and could penetrate international markets. Thus, in order to increase the quality of the Jong Sarat, a number of new innovations should be intensified. Malaysian community airline operator Firefly has welcomed its first ATR-72600, a more eco-friendly and fuel-efficient aircraft, to its existing fleet. Firefly ordered 20 new generation ATR-72600 aircrafts in 2007, building on its existing 12 ATR-72500 fleet. 
The first ATR-72-600 from Toulouse, France, began its first commercial flight to Johor Bahru from the Sky Park Terminal in Subang on July 12. Nineteen more of the turboprop aircraft will enter service in stages until 2019 as part of Firefly's expansion. The new aircraft is the most advanced propeller aircraft to date and greatly increases the safety and comfort of passengers. It uses a significantly less fuel and has 50% less carbon emissions than other regional jets. Firefly Chief Executive Officer Ignatius Ong said the new aircraft will enable Firefly to further expand its regional offering by adding new routes, frequencies and connectivity to the ASEAN network. The airline's passenger manifest has grown from 100,000 in 2007 to 1.7 million last year. Ong reiterated that the airline is working closely with the private sector to grow the aviation industry's contribution to Malaysia's gross domestic product. On listing plans, Ong said the airline has no plans to float its shares on Borsa Malaysia yet. It needs to strengthen its operations and secure its position in the market for the time being. Firefly is a wholly owned subsidiary of Malaysia Airline System, MES, and began operations in April 2007. It currently flies to 25 domestic and regional destinations within Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore and Indonesia. Katala or cockatoos hold a different kind of beauty. Somehow, these birds are choosy where to breed and live. One of their chosen habitats is Island Rasa located at Nara, Palawan. This island is peaceful for cockatoos as this is protected by forests or wildlife rangers. The Katala Foundation said these birds are very sensitive and can lay eggs just two times a year, which can lead to extinction if they are not protected. The wildlife rangers demonstrated spectators on how to climb up and see the cockatoo's nest. Edwin is one of the wildlife rangers. It's just like Tarzan. He uses vines to visit the birds' nesting holes in trees. Meanwhile, cockatoos are adept to living together with humans, and that's why they keep on coming back even if released in the wild. Each of these birds has different stories. This one, after being released in El Nido, Palawan, keeps coming back to a popular hotel buffet to eat, so a decision was made to put it in a cage. Feathers decorate a bird, however. These birds do not want their feathers anymore, so they're trying to remove it without any reason. A brace was attached to their neck to prevent them from removing their feathers. Cockatoos are a wonderful creation, even if they're flying or inside a cage. They're still beautiful to look at. Philippine cockatoos are considered abundant in the Philippines. Over 30 employees of online property firm Property Guru recently shaved their hair as a pledge to help children with cancer. The pledge was a result of a bidding war that started between staff. The winner gets to shave the head of co-founder and group chief executive officer Steve Melhuish. It is part of the Hair for Hope head shaving event, which aims to raise awareness and funds for families of children who have cancer. In total, more than 20,000 Singapore dollars was raised, including donations from sponsors. And the winning bid to shave Steve's head was 1,000 Singapore dollars by the head of consumer marketing, Melvin Kwok. One of our core values is around respect, uh, and uh, that's a big part of what we do and feel very strongly about it. So um, this year, we decided to choose uh, children's cancer. Uh, uh, children and cancer, two um, causes that I personally feel very strongly about, but the whole company has rallied behind it. Very, very proud to be part of that, and uh, it's a small sacrifice to have no hair for a couple of months.